Welcome back, everybody, to the NCAA Next Up Dynasty here on NCAA Football 14. Today we are getting through weeks 7, 8, and 9 here in the 2024 college football season. We're sort of exiting that beginning stage and now really finding out which teams are contending for the playoff. There have been a lot of fun storylines this year, as shown by some of these graphics, including offense rules this day. I rule this day, nuggets, fries, drink bars just been raised. Ed Whopper Jr. is something new, a barbecue bacon junior just for you. BK, have it your way. That was way too easy of a joke to make, and I really hope I don't get copyrighted, but we're just going to roll with it. So in the last episode, we covered weeks four through six, and we really gained a lot of information on these teams. We saw the defending national champion TCU Horn Frogs lose two of their games, falling out of the top 25 entirely. We're watching contenders like Ohio State and Clemson look legit so far, while other highly ranked teams such as Michigan appear to be fading. We're also looking at some newer schools rising up the ranks. Stanford and Virginia are both undefeated. They both have really tough schedules today, so it'll be interesting to see how they do. And there may be some teams who we do not expect to cause a rise in the rankings, whether we have some surprising teams move up or some really good teams prove to be fraudulent and move down. As we look at the current AP poll, Clemson is back at number one. They were not number one for week six, in which that was Georgia, and Georgia lost. So they wasted their one opportunity in the top spot. Undefeated Ohio State, Miami, and Middle Tennessee State occupy the top four. There really are not many undefeated teams left. Most of the top 25 is taken over by one-loss teams at this point, and with likely some of these undefeated schools losing, it's going to become even more of a trend today. Georgia quarterback Aram Ketchikan remains the pretty clear Heisman favorite at the moment. Right now, it's really going to be a question of who ends up competing with him for the trophy. One of the other big storylines this year has been the amount of quarterbacks who have gotten hurt. There are some big ones that we talked about in the last episode, such as Stanford's quarterback carousel. They have like four different guys playing for them. And other big names like Marco Prince, Kyler Kitaude, and Rufus Motley out for extended periods. There were also some quarterback injuries that we did not talk about. Jacob King's only going to miss a week, but that one week is against number three Miami. TCU's Tegan Yeager is going to miss some time. And then the big one that we have not yet talked about, Oklahoma State Jorgensen Jupiter broke his foot and he is out for the year. A massive loss for Oklahoma State because Jupiter has been playing so well. He has been really carrying that team and I would not be surprised if Oklahoma State plays really poorly now that his season comes to a close. Let's take a look at the slate today, starting off in Week 7. Got some pretty exciting games here. I think Cincinnati and Duke should be interesting. Duke has to rebound after getting clobbered in the last episode by Miami. Stanford's got some tough games today. Baylor and Missouri should be very interesting. Florida State-Miami, probably the game of the week, although Florida State is, of course, without their starting quarterback in week eight, we'll see if Texas can rebound against a tough Auburn team. And then going down the board even more, Virginia going to the shoe to face off against number two, Ohio State. That should be a pretty interesting game. And then Stanford and Notre Dame, big time rivals. A huge test for Stanford to see if they are legit. And then looking at week nine, there are five games with multiple top 25 teams playing each other, such as Florida and Georgia, Ohio State and Penn State, Auburn, Oklahoma, Miami, Virginia, and then the late game is Alabama and Tennessee. Let's start off with Cincinnati and Duke. The Blue Devils just got clobbered by Miami, and they need to make a statement this week against a pretty tough opponent with the Cincinnati Bearcats. Cincinnati's offense played pretty well today. Senior quarterback Seth Maddox is quietly having a really good year, and he had another good performance today, albeit against a bad Duke defense. But Cincinnati could not stop the dynamic duo of Justin Tucker and Jabari Kruger. Obviously, Tucker, the quarterback, he's the big name on this offense. He's probably going to be a top 10 pick. But Jabari Kruger, wide receiver, is a very possible first rounder as well, as Duke would end up getting the win here in this matchup by the final score of 38-35. to Justin Tucker had a pretty ordinary day for his standards, throwing for four touchdowns, all four of which were caught by Jabari Kruger. Cincinnati's offense held up the entire game, but their defense could not. The next game on the docket is number 13, Notre Dame, against number 17, Nebraska. Both of these schools are looking for a signature in-conference Big Ten win. 
And, well, one of them's going to get it today, and it was pretty clear early on that that would be Notre Dame. The Irish dominated on the ground per usual. MJ Hill, the senior running back, had another great game. But the big storyline for me with Notre Dame today was the play of quarterback Baz Boyd, who has been pretty underwhelming throughout his collegiate career. But today he really threw the ball well, throwing for three scores as Nebraska would fall to the Irish. A big time win here for Notre Dame, who has been playing quite well since their week two loss to Alabama. The Marquez Shakir experiment continues to be a roller coaster for Nebraska, who still finds themselves ranked, although they are currently 0-3 within the conference. As we talked about with Baz Boyd, he played really well, one of the most efficient games of his career. Next up, let's head down to Virginia as they face off against North Carolina, who's been pretty disappointing this year. As for UVA, this is their best chance to win today because their next two games are against top three opponents. They play against Ohio State next week, followed by Miami the following week. So Virginia's schedule gets really tough, and this very well could be a trap game. And sure enough, it really looked like that. North Carolina led late before Virginia was able to get a game-tying touchdown to ultimately bring it into overtime. Virginia would start with the ball first, and they would ultimately start off with a nice pass here for the end zone. However, it would be intercepted by Yaoundé Moutier, meaning all North Carolina has to do is score, and they'll pull off the upset, and they would do exactly that. Splitting the uprights as North Carolina upsets Virginia by the final score of 45-42 in overtime as UVA loses their first game of the year, and it does not get any easier for Virginia who plays against Ohio State and Miami these next two weeks. George Eddy did throw for five touchdowns, but he was outdone by the freshman running back, Riley Lumpkins, who was able to run for four. The South Alabama Jaguars have been really good this year, particularly on offense. They have scored a lot of points. They've been able to get a lot of yards. They have a tough test here against the really good University of South Florida offense. And, well, South Florida scored a lot of points, 38, and they still lost by 21 South Alabama's offense dominated, dropping 59 points. Quarterback QJ Reddings threw seven touchdowns. Wide receiver Sammy Wooses caught eight passes for over 300 yards and four touchdowns. As South Alabama accumulated for nearly 700 yards of total offense. This team can outscore anybody, but I am a little bit concerned about South Alabama's defense. They allow a lot of yards and plenty of points. So... South Alabama may be able to score a lot, but I'm a little bit worried when they play some really good teams defensively. Stanford has been one of the most fun stories to follow this year. They're 6-0. They're undefeated. They've been a very pleasant surprise as they face off against the Air Force in a Pac-12 matchup. Again, this could be a trap game for Stanford, who is ready for Notre Dame next week. And Stanford really did not play all that well in this game. A late touchdown by the Air Force Falcons would ultimately bring this game into overtime. Hint, hint, there's going to be a lot of overtime games today, so get used to it. Air Force would get the ball first, and they would score a touchdown, meaning that Stanford's going to have to answer, and they did not. Air Force takes the win 42-35 here against Stanford. A big-time win for the Falcons as Stanford loses their first game of the year. Stanford's far from out of the playoff race, but... With Notre Dame on the schedule next week, if they lose that game, then they could really be losing all the momentum they were able to build early in this season. Next up, we've got our first Pick'em game of the week between Baylor and Missouri. Despite being one-and-a-half point underdogs, Missouri garners around 69% nice of the vote. Baylor is favored today, and there's a reason why I made them favored, and that's because they are a better football team than Missouri, and they showed it. Sophomore running back Dontavious Brown continued his Heisman-esque campaign running through the Missouri defense as Baylor would take this one 50-28. So Baylor gets a big win after losing in the last episode to Vanderbilt by a lot. MJ Combs threw four interceptions this game. He really struggled. Forrest Holloway was not great either, but it did not matter because Dontavious Brown carried Baylor yet again. Seems to be a common theme with this team. Number one, Clemson heads down to Navy to face off against the midshipmen here in Annapolis. Clemson has kind of been coasting along this year, but they haven't lost yet. Although this is a tough matchup. Navy's a good team. They've only lost one game so far. And sure enough, this ended up being a really close game. 
Clemson's offense was pretty solid. Cedric Chapman made some big throws, although he was inefficient. And then on the other side of the ball, Navy did not throw the ball particularly well, but they would get a late touchdown here from Ishmael Abinakande to bring it into overtime. Clemson would get the ball first. They would score a field goal. If Navy scores a touchdown, they can dethrone the number one team in the country. They would not do that. They would only kick a field goal, bringing us to a double overtime. Navy gets the ball first, and Torian Wilson would score a touchdown, putting the midshipmen up by seven. Clemson would get it back, and they would respond with a score of their own from Aquesto Chigalomoklo, bringing us into a third overtime. Clemson, starting with the ball, would unable to convert this third down run by Chapman, meaning they would have to kick a field goal. So Navy has another opportunity to score a game-winning touchdown, and this time they took advantage of their opportunity as Torian Wilson would punch it in. And for the second straight week, the number one team in the country loses. Last week it was Georgia. This time it's Clemson as they fall 36-33 to the midshipmen in triple overtime. Navy jumps up to 21 here with this huge victory. They did not throw the ball well, but Torian Wilson continued to make plays on the ground. And then Cedric Chapman was not very efficient. 10 of 28 is just not going to cut it. Chapman's had some good moments this year, but I just don't see him as a national championship caliber quarterback. We haven't really talked about Middle Tennessee State yet. They quietly are having themselves another really good season, although they have a tough matchup this week against UAB. The Blazers are currently 4-0. They're playing some great football so far this year, but they would get absolutely curb stomped by Middle Tennessee State. The Blue Raiders offense dominated in this one, winning the game 49-20. If Middle Tennessee State keeps this up, it looks like there's a very good shot. They will be back in the college football playoff for a third straight season. They've been unable to get the job done the first two years, but maybe this time it's going to be different as they jump up to 6-0. The poll makers are deciding to respect how good they've been throughout this series, so they're going to bump them up to the number two spot in the rankings, which I think is well-deserved. Through the two seasons in this series, Middle Tennessee State has lost one regular season game. That's impressive. Number 12, Florida State heads to Miami to take on the number three ranked Hurricanes, who get 75% of the pick'em vote. Keep in mind, Florida State is without their starting quarterback, Jacob King, this week. The Seminoles decided to have a quarterback rotation. They played both their second and third stringer. Miami's offense was inefficient, but good, per usual. That's kind of how Miami's offense rolls. Florida State was able to move the ball just fine with their backup quarterbacks today, which is certainly impressive. And ultimately, this game, like many others this week, would go into overtime. Florida State would start with the ball, and Jay Sean Tate would punch it in for a score. And then Miami would answer back as Justin Jones, the former five-star recruit, would punch it in, bringing us to a double overtime. Miami would have it here on a fourth and goal. They would elect to go for it as Scooter Young would look here for the end zone on a miraculous near one-handed catch by Keylor Jamison, but he's unable to come down with it, meaning Anthony Woodard can punch it in for the Seminoles. And there you go, number three, Miami falls in defeat to Florida State here in double overtime, 51-45. to Scooter Young Jr. completed 41% of his passes, and he ran for under four yards a carry, but he still made a lot of big plays, so a typical Scooter Young performance. Impressive, but inefficient. Miami is the second top three team to lose this week as their ACC buddies Clemson lost earlier. So there should be plenty of movement in the AP poll with two of the three highest ranked teams falling. Looking at some of the other scores here in week seven, Penn State and USC take care of business. Arizona State jumps in the top 25 despite beating only Old Dominion by just three. Georgia dominates Oregon and Tennessee with nice wins. Ohio State beats Michigan State pretty handedly. South Carolina squeaks away from Arkansas, 35-33. Florida beats Vanderbilt by 20. And then going down the board even further, Virginia Tech drops 63. Auburn with a nice win. Central Michigan with a nice win. And Alabama defeats Texas A&M. Looking at some of the other scores, Minnesota beats Northwestern. Memphis beats Texas Tech. I was very wrong on Texas Tech. I thought they were going to be really good. You know who is really good? Memphis. Those guys are 5-1 and one, playing well. Purdue finally wins their first game of the year a little longer than I expected. Michigan gets back on the win column as they beat Indiana. Pitt wins their third consecutive game, defeating Illinois by just three, handing the Illini their first loss of the season. 
And then looking down the board even farther, Washington State wins their first game of the year, finally. Ohio finally gets a MAC win. They're a team I was high on going into the year and have been a little bit disappointing. Houston gets killed by Iowa State. Pretty embarrassing if you're the Cougars, if you ask me. And then looking at some of the later games, LSU would lose again. They are now 0-7 as they lose to a bad Louisville team. I think that's Louisville's first win. Syracuse beats winless Boston College, while Texas gets back on the win column after a three-game losing streak. Kansas with a nice win. TCU gets a big win over UCF as well. So let's take a look at the polls. Only two undefeated teams at the top with Ohio State and Middle Tennessee State, thanks to Clemson and Miami losing. Those two drop to 9-10. and 10. Florida, Oklahoma, Alabama, Oregon, and Georgia all jump up two spots, while Florida State goes up four. Notre Dame only moves up one despite a big win. And Navy, Virginia Tech, and Arizona hop into the top 25 with Stanford, Virginia, and Vanderbilt dropping out. So we are now through seven weeks. Most teams have played five to six games so far. And there are now only currently five undefeated teams left. Ohio State is the only undefeated Power 5 school. you got Middle Tennessee State and South Alabama, both of whom have not lost this year. Central Michigan is having themselves another really good season. And then Texas State is also undefeated. I'm not ready to take them seriously yet. Texas State plays against a tough pit team this week. If they win that game, then maybe I'll take them seriously. As for the Heisman watch, no real movement other than Barrett Cherokee climbing up to the fifth spot. But look at the storyline. The poor play of Davis, referring to Mookie Davis, the Ohio State running back, makes him not a Heisman candidate. Mookie Davis is averaging over 7.5 yards a carry, averaging 100 rushing yards a game, and over 40 receiving yards a game, while averaging 12 yards per reception after the catch. It's one thing to not have him in the Heisman top five, which he should be, but it's another thing to say he's playing poorly when he has been, at worst, a top two running back, maybe number one in the country. So I don't get that at all, but okay. Players of the Week, B.E. Latore, the defensive tackle from Kansas, and then Penn State quarterback, Lyndon Kirkstead. Let's move over to Week 8 now. We've got plenty of more big games. A lot of highly ranked teams have some questions to answer. Auburn, Texas is interesting. Tennessee and South Carolina, I'm curious to see which one of those schools can get some momentum on their season. Central Michigan's got a tough matchup with Bowling Green. They're a good team. Penn State is a tough test with Indiana. They're looking even farther. Nebraska's got a tough game with a pretty good UCLA team. Virginia and Ohio State should be pretty interesting. We'll see if Virginia can rebound. Iowa could be a tough game for the Oregon Ducks. And then Stanford and Notre Dame, the big rivalry as Stanford looks to get back on the win column with what would be a huge signature win against the Fighting Irish. Let's start with Tennessee and South Carolina. Both of these schools have had rocky seasons so far, but they've had some high moments for sure. Which one will have a high moment today? Well, this game ended up being pretty close. Tennessee and South Carolina ended up going down to the wire. It felt like Tennessee had control for most of this game, which I think gave them the advantage throughout most of the day. Skeeter Darlington had this nice touchdown right here. But a few drives late in the game would propel South Carolina to a close 21-23 victory. South Carolina is a really interesting story because they lost their starting quarterback, Marco Prince, a few weeks ago. And although the quarterback play has not been good since he got injured, the team has played a lot better as a unit, and they've really rallied around their star player getting injured. Malachi Evans did not throw the ball well for South Carolina, but maybe the injury to their star quarterback was kind of a slap in the face for them, and clearly they are taking it in stride. Number 18, Auburn is next up. They face off against Texas, who finally won last week for the first time in quite a bit. Texas is a talented team who has just had a lot of trouble putting it together, but they were able to put some things together today. Quarterback Onyx St. James did not have his most efficient day of throwing the football, but he did look dynamic. He made some big-time throws inside and out of the pocket, leading Texas to the upset win in Jordan-Hare against the Auburn Tigers, who started the year off really well, but are starting to look a little bit more fraudulent. 49-34, your final. Auburn remains ranked with a great performance from quarterback Jet Jackson as they are still 5-2. As for the Longhorns, 40% completion percentage is not good, but five passing touchdowns sure is. Next up, we take a look at South Alabama. They're 5-0. Their offense is really good. Their defense is not really good. South Alabama combines for over 1,000 yards per game if you combine their offensive and defensive averages. 
That is a lot, and I'm pretty sure there was over 1,000 combined yards in this game again. South Alabama's offense did their job per usual. This has been one of the best units in college football. But as I said when we talked about the Jaguars last week, it's only a matter of time until their defense kind of blows it for them. And unfortunately, today was that day. The Rice offense was phenomenal, led by senior quarterback Johnny Woodsman. His receivers made some big plays in this game, leading Rice to the upset. When South Carolina made the college football playoff a couple seasons ago, it was because their defense was probably the best in the country. But Cardell Simpson is not walking through that door. They now have one of the worst defenses in the country as they fall to 5-1, and one, allowing a four-touchdown game to Woodman. J. Reddings did all he could. He played great. His draft stock is continuing to rise. These two teams have a combined total of zero wins through the halfway point of the year. I don't need to tell you that's bad. LSU finally has a great opportunity to win their first game of the year. They're 0-7. Can this be the day? Hell freaking yeah. Otto Askew had a big game in the air for LSU, leading them to a blowout victory here in front of a sold-out, packed house. Yeah, I'm being sarcastic. Not a lot of people are showing up, and I don't blame them because this football program has been a joke the last few years. But hey, they beat UTSA by 31 points, so pat on the back. Otto Askew needs to be LSU's full-time quarterback. I think at this point he's just a better player than Thomas Toromenko, and LSU's got to have enough balls to make that switch at some point. Arizona has been one of the most fascinating teams to follow in this series because I think they've always been the most talented team in the Pac-12. They certainly have the best quarterback in the conference, but it always feels like there's something left to be desired with Arizona, and, well, today was no different. Their offense was solid. Quarterback Kareem Kamar did not have his best day, but he was still pretty good, but their defense could not stop Boise State. Although quarterback skipper Lansdale was inefficient, he relied on his number one receiver, Kevin Shasha Jr., to have a few big catches, including that touchdown and a late score from running back Jose Rhinoegg would be enough to propel Boise State to the upset here on the blue turf, 29-28. Arizona's stay in the rankings will be short-lived, although skipper Lansdale did not play all that well. Kareem Kumar was also pretty mediocre for his standards, only completing 56% of his passes and throwing two interceptions. Nebraska's been pretty disappointing this year, and I think their only way, realistic way at least, to get into the college football playoff is to win out and hope they get an at-large bid. And that starts with this matchup here against UCLA. And Nebraska just looks like they don't have it. They looked flat out there. They looked like their season was toast. Because quite frankly, at this point, it is toast. UCLA, on the other hand, is a very underrated team, in my opinion. They've been really solid this year. Their offense scores a lot of points. They scored 38 today, blowing out Nebraska, who is finally unranked. Marquez Shakir hasn't exactly lit the world on fire. I don't think he's been bad, but I feel like there's been a little bit left to be desired from him. And on the other side, Jay Sean Tatum, the junior quarterback for UCLA, had one of his best games of his career. Number five, Alabama heads down to Arkansas to face off against the Razorbacks. There have been a number of upsets today. Could this be the next one on the ballot? And through the first quarter, the answer looked like a big ol' hell yes. After one, Arkansas led 21 to nothing with two big touchdown runs by Cannon McMullen, the projected top running back off the board in this year's draft. The second projected running back to go in this year's class is Alabama's Darius Coley, who got injured on the second offensive snap of the game, causing him to miss the rest. That meant Tyon Christopher had to step up down the stretch, and boy did he. Christopher was able to lead a big comeback as Alabama would survive, and they defeat the Razorbacks 38-35. Got to give a lot of credit to Arkansas. They gave it all they had. Cannon McMullen balled out. But sometimes talent prevails, and after the first quarter, that definitely was the case. I think Troy Davenport has shown a lot of development this year. He's been a lot more efficient than he was last year, and if he plays well, Alabama can beat anyone. Next up, we have Houston and TCU. This matchup was a little bit more exciting last year because both of these teams were playoff caliber teams, and of course, both of them ended up getting in, while this year, both teams had their season kind of falling on a thread. Tegan Yeager did not play due to an injury, so Cade Brown would end up getting the start for TCU. He was fine. He wasn't bad, but I won't say he was good. 
Then on the other side of the ball, Karam Baker was pretty solid for Houston. The real star of the show, however, was wide receiver Kramer Gildeford, who had a great game. Despite Houston's Heisman contending quarterback last year, Kane Sanders now being in the NFL, Kramer Gildeford has not missed a beat. He has still been one of the best receivers in the country as Houston wins just by one, 35-34. TCU now falls to 4-3, and 2-3 and three in conference. I think at this point, a college football playoff run for TCU does not look likely. I said last year, TCU's championship window was just that season. They capitalized, and clearly the championship door is back shut. Let's stay in the Big 12 now as winless BYU, who is just flat-out terrible, faces off against the Missouri Tigers, who are coming off their first loss of the season against Baylor. This should be an easy opportunity to rebound, a layup, the easiest game they're going to have on their schedule at home, and they lost. Yeah. I was pretty excited about Missouri going into the episode because they were undefeated, they were playing well in a Power 5 conference, and, I mean, losing to Baylor is one thing, but losing to winless BYU is another. 38-31, your final. Missouri falls out of the top 25 with another disappointing performance from quarterback MJ Combs. I never really saw this team as a championship contender, and it looks like my intuition has been proven correct considering they lost to BYU. Baylor nearly lost to BYU last episode. Now they're going to face off against the University of Connecticut. UConn is not nearly as bad as BYU. The Huskies are a pretty tough opponent. So I guess that should make Baylor feel a little bit better because they also lost. The Big 12 is so odd. TCU's been disappointing. Missouri and Baylor seem to be the two best teams in the conference, but they're not playing well. I would throw Oklahoma State's hat into the ring, but with Jorgens and Jupiter out for the year, I can't see them making a run. I know we give the Pac-12 a lot of flack, and deservedly so, but at least this year, the Big 12 is really not much better. Number 15, Central Michigan is undefeated, but they've got their toughest test of the season as they face off against the Falcons of Bowling Green, who have only lost one game so far undefeated in conference. This is Central Michigan's opportunity to show that they are a Power 5 caliber team and very well could make a college football playoff run. Well, they did not show that today as Bowling Green would pull off the upset and hypothetically, if Middle Tennessee State falls off and they are not the Group 5 representative for the college football playoff, could Bowling Green be that team to do it? I know Central Michigan's been the obvious name as the second-best Group 5 team in the country, but maybe it's Bowling Green. Neither quarterback was very efficient at all. Overall, it was a pretty low-scoring defensive battle, but Bowling Green looks to be pretty good. They've been disappointing the last couple of years, but they look quite good. Number one, Ohio State faces off against Virginia. Virginia is only getting around 12.5% of the votes. I don't really know why those people picked Virginia to begin with, but they did. This game ended up being surprisingly a lot closer than I expected. Coming off an overtime loss last week against UNC, Virginia gave it everything they got today. They gave up a really impressive fight here against Ohio State. This late touchdown run by Mookie Davis where he broke like four tackles would put the game into overtime. Yeah, was, didn't the game say Mookie Davis was having a poor season? So Virginia started overtime with a field goal. Ohio State would look to answer, but the kick would be no good. And thus, Virginia knocks off number one Ohio State in the shoe, 34-31. If you have been counting at home, kids, that is now three consecutive weeks where the number one team has lost. And with that, Middle Tennessee State is now the number one team in the poll. So does that mean they're going to end up losing this week? Because the number one team seems to be like a cursed spot right now. Has that ever happened where three number one teams have lost in a row? The final game of the day is Notre Dame and Stanford. The Cardinals seem to be the sexy upset pick, getting over 72% of the votes despite being underdogs. Again, there's a reason why Notre Dame was favored, and boy did they show it today. The Irish completely dominated in this game, reminding the world who they are. Notre Dame lost a lot of credibility last year after getting blown out in the college football playoff by Cal. But ever since their opening week loss to Alabama, they have been really good. They crushed Stanford today, 45-19. Notre Dame did not move up at all in the poll, which I think is kind of unfair. I mean, Stanford has six wins. They are a good team. Baz Boyd didn't even throw the ball well, which is the most impressive part. When he's on, I think Notre Dame can beat almost anybody. 
As for Stanford, it seems like the clock is striking midnight for them. They might not be the next TCU, which I thought there was a chance maybe they could be. Let's take a look at some of the other scores around the country. Clemson rebounds by dropping 54 on Maryland. Mississippi State still only has one loss. They quietly have been really good this year. USC with a nice win. They also have been quietly really good. Cal is back ranked. They clobber Washington State. Penn State defeats Indiana. Michigan is back ranked. Middle Tennessee State and Florida State each get blowout wins. Duke drops 49 with a great performance from Justin Tucker. And then Navy gets a solid win. Oregon, Virginia Tech, Miami, they win close games. Oklahoma drops 66 on Kansas. And Georgia gets another win. Looking at other scores, Cincinnati continues to play well. I believe they are the only team undefeated in Big 12 conference play. And then going down the board a little bit further, Buffalo beats Ohio. Tulsa is now 6-1. They are really good for a second straight season. Texas Tech beats UAB. That's a little bit of a surprise. Michigan State drops 59 on Illinois. And then looking down even further, Kent State puts up 55 points. That's a lot. Texas State loses 41-13 to against Pitt. So clearly they are not legit as they lose their first game of the year. Boston College finally wins a game, 31-17 over winless Western Kentucky. So it's not much of a win, but I guess they'll take it. And then Ole Miss, Kentucky, and Washington get nice wins. Oklahoma gets clobbered with no Jorgensen Jupiter. Who could have seen that one coming? Definitely not me. Wink, wink. So Middle Tennessee State is now number one. They are the only team getting first place votes as they are the only undefeated team here at the top. I understand them being number one, but are they really the best team in the country? I don't know. A lot of SEC teams close behind them. Ohio State drops to nine with Virginia, Michigan, and Cal hopping into the top 25 while Missouri, Nebraska, and Arizona fall out. We talked about the five teams who were undefeated going into the week. Well, four of them lost. Middle Tennessee State is the only undefeated team left. Their consistency in this series has been so impressive. They've only lost one regular season game since the start of this series, which was two and a half seasons ago. Now, yes, they're only one and two in the college football playoff, but it looks highly likely they'll get back there, although they do at their toughest stretch of their schedule here late in the season. So it's not impossible for them to lose a game or two, but even if they do, they'll still be in line to most likely get that group five playoff spot. In terms of the Heisman watch, Calligan October and Darius Coley swap spots, mainly because Coley got hurt. He will be back this week for Alabama, thankfully. As we look at the Players of the Week here for Week 8, Casey Skinner, the UCF safety on defense, and then on offense, Justin Tucker with seven total touchdowns and just three incompletions. Justin Tucker has been even better than he was last year, and he's not in the Heisman watch, and I have no clue why. The first college football playoff rankings are out this year. This is the college football playoff committee, the people who choose the teams in the playoffs, ranking all of the schools. So currently, the top 10 teams are in, along with Baylor and Cal. The reason why Baylor and Cal are not this high is because, well, they're not top 10 teams. But since they are the highest ranked schools in the Big 12 and Pac-12, they would get those last two spots. So currently, Baylor and Cal, along with the top 10 teams, are in the playoff if the season were to end today. That'll bring us to Week 9. This might be the most entertaining slate of games the entire season with a lot of really big-time matchups. Florida and Georgia at the top of the list. The winner has the inside track to win the SEC East Division. Auburn, Oklahoma is a good game. Then looking down even farther, Ohio State, Penn State. The Buckeyes looking to get back on track. Miami and Virginia should be a lot of fun. And then the late game is Alabama and Tennessee. So that's five games between multiple teams in the top 25. We start with Oregon and UCLA. The Bruins have quietly been really good this year, and an interesting storyline with this game is that Oregon quarterback Barrett Cherokee's fiance was in labor. So Cherokee did not play in the first half. The backup, Keone Hilari, who will be competing for Oregon's QB job next year, actually played pretty well. Barrett Cherokee would return for the second half, where he ended up playing really well. So both quarterbacks performed well for Oregon, but I can't really say the same about their defense. UCLA very quietly has had one of the best offenses in the country this year. These guys score a whole lot of points, and they did just that in the second half, upsetting the Oregon Ducks. This is Big Ten country now in Los Angeles, California. Who would have guessed? 
UCLA wins 31 to 28. The Bruins scored 28 points in the second half, and they are ranked for the first time in this series as they move up to number 21. As for Oregon, they dropped to 12. Barrett Cherokee had other things to worry about in the first half. I don't think you can get mad at him or blame him. It's life. He had a kid. So congratulations, Barrett. Your team lost and is one step closer to not making the college football playoff. Number eight, Clemson has to show us something here. They have looked fraudulent for a little while. They're playing against a bad Louisville team, so this should be a game that Clemson wins with no problem. Well, not so fast. Louisville dominated in the first half, and I mean it was not close. The Cardinals lead 24-7 going into half. Clemson played really well in the second half to take a lead, but Louisville quarterback Prince Parks would tie it late, bringing it into overtime. Clemson lost two weeks ago in overtime to Navy, so they've got to manage it better today as they allow a field goal in their first defensive possession. They can't lose in overtime again, right? Well, not today, as Marco Mazzilio Jr. would catch the game when he touched down. Clemson survives 44-41. You still can't feel good if you're a Clemson fan because these guys just look fraudulent. I feel like it's only a matter of time until they start losing some games. If you're looking for a positive, Cedric Chapman had probably his best game as a passer, so that's good. All right, here we go. Number two, Florida, and number six, Georgia. The Bulldogs are the favorite today, garnering around 60% of the vote. I figured regardless, this would be a pretty close game, and boy was I wrong. Georgia quarterback Aram Kachikan got injured on the first drive of the game, and from there, it only went downhill. Florida led 28-3 at halftime, and we know Georgia things know a thing or two about 28-3 leads not being held. But there was no lead choking today. The Gators had control the entire way, and they would win in a blowout, 45-17. I'm not too worried about Georgia. Aaron Kachikan will be fine going forward. But I think the bigger story here is Florida. You can really make a case that the Gators right now are playing better than anybody. They lost a close game in Week 3 to a really good Oklahoma team, and then ever since that, they have been nearly flawless, largely because of the development of quarterback Ernie Capillard. Number 13, Mississippi State heads down to Lexington to face off against the Kentucky Wildcats. It's been an up-and-down season for Kentucky. They've been very streaky, but currently they are on a win streak. And, well, streaky teams generally have long streaks. And, well, Kentucky's going to add a win to theirs as they would end up beating Mississippi State today 44-24. Despite only having one loss, I didn't really view Mississippi State in that upper class of SEC teams like Georgia and Florida and Oklahoma and Alabama. And I think they showed today that they are a tier below those schools. Mississippi State's a good team, but I don't quite think they are a playoff caliber team. Their starting quarterback, Wynn Quinton, is still injured. And their backup, Ryan Gay, has done a formidable job. He's been able to keep the ship afloat, but he has not been able to accelerate the ship. I think right now, Boston College is one of the worst Power 5 teams in the country. They just won their first game of the year against a really bad Western Kentucky team. Now they get to travel out to Duke to face off against the number 15 ranked Blue Devils. This game should be a walk in the park for Duke. It should be easy, light work, but quarterback Justin Tucker had other plans. Justin Tucker has seen the disrespect that he is not in the Heisman race and he took his aggression out on Boston College today. He got some help from his number one receiver, Jabari Kruger, who made maybe the catch of the year, but right now, nobody is playing better than Justin Tucker. Last week against Georgia, he only threw three incompletions and scored seven all-purpose touchdowns. Well, today he won up himself with seven touchdowns and just two incompletions as Duke wins 70-38. to The score at halftime of this game was 49 to 10. Boston College scored a lot in the second half, but it didn't matter because Justin Tucker is just too good. Duke's defense sucks. Their roster is not good, but they're 6-1. and one. They're number 13. Justin Tucker is carrying this team right now, and the fact that he's not in the Heisman race is blasphemous to me. With how well Justin Tucker has been playing, a lot of scouts believe that he is now the top quarterback in this year's draft. So that means Oklahoma's Romeo Colochi is going to have to give an answer. This is our final pick -em game of the day. Oklahoma is getting a whopping 81% of the votes, but I don't think that's a good thing. The team that has gotten a majority of the votes today has lost every game. Well, somebody's got to break the streak, and that team would ultimately be Oklahoma. 
Romeo Colochi would throw four passing touchdowns, all four of which came in the first half. And then in the second half, Oklahoma was able to ride the pine as they would win this game pretty easily against a tough Auburn team. Romeo Colochi also is not in the Heisman race, and I think that is also incredibly disrespectful. Colochi and Justin Tucker have been two of the three best quarterbacks in the country. I don't think that's a stretch, and neither of them are in the Heisman race right now, which is just crazy to me. But as they continue to play well, NFL teams are going to realize this, and, well, those two players both look like they're going to be top five picks. Nebraska really has been struggling. They've got to right the ship here, and it's not going to be easy as they head down to the L.A. Coliseum to face off against the number 11-ranked USC Trojans, who have not lost since their first game of the year. Marquez Shakir had one of his better performances today, a positive sign for Nebraska, but their defense did not have a so positive performance. Scotty Kimbrell had another really good game, connecting on this pass for Caden Morgan for a nice touchdown. Monty Bradley had another good game on the ground, while USC continues to be one of the quietly best teams in the country. They have not lost since their opening game of the season to Indiana. I get this isn't like a blowout or anything, and that Nebraska's kind of bad. They're 0-5 in conference. But a win's a win, especially against a team like Nebraska, who was good enough to make the college football playoff last year. This season, not so much, considering they have five losses. There's no way they're going to make a conference championship. There's no way they're going to get an at-large bid. It's over. Number nine, Ohio State, looking to get back on the win column, heads to Beaver Stadium to face off against Penn State. Both teams currently have one loss up to this point. They both don't really want another. The thing with Ohio State this year is they've kind of slept-walked through a lot of first halves. Today being no different, Penn State led after the first half. The Buckeyes would assert their dominance in the second half and win this game, but it was far from convincing. Now, you'll take a road win against a top 15 ranked rival, so I don't think Ohio State is complaining, and they shouldn't be complaining, but I wouldn't say my stock is up on the Buckeyes today, although they do take this one 42-31. Lyndon Kirkstead played pretty solid, certainly not his fault for the loss. I think it was just the defense kind of letting them down in the second half. As for Ohio State, Puma Whitlock is not putting up like crazy numbers, but he has not turned the ball over once in seven games for Ohio State. That's like unprecedented for a first year starting quarterback. Number 21, Michigan returns home to the big house, although it's rainy today, as they face off against a pretty good Illinois team who was 4-0 going into the day. They are now 4-2, looking to get back on the win column. And, well, after the first quarter, the score was 28 to nothing in favor of Illinois. The Illini dominated early in this game, and then after the first quarter, Michigan kind of clawed their way back. But the Wolverines were never really in this game as Illinois would end up winning 40-24. to Personally, I think Illinois should be ranked. They're quietly a pretty good team. As for Michigan, they drop out of the rankings, and deservedly so. This Michigan team is kind of missing an edge without Bartholomew Blunt, with him, of course, being in the NFL. While Calligan October is still a Heisman contender, he really shouldn't be with how well guys like Justin Tucker and Romeo Colochi are playing. Number 10, Miami heads to the University of Virginia to face off against the Cavaliers, who just knocked off number one Ohio State a week ago. This game ended up being a pretty close one as expected. Virginia's fan base is riled up. They're feeling good about themselves. And, well, Virginia played pretty well against a superior team in terms of talent. But, again, talent would prevail as Miami would take a close one here, 31-29. to My concerns about Miami's offense are still there. They're a dynamic group, but they're just so inefficient. Scooty Young misses a lot of throws. He has a lot of bad runs. And that can be a problem once Miami gets to the playoff, if they even do, which is far from a guarantee because this team is not perfect. But when Miami's on, I think they're up there as one of the best teams in the country. I think the ceiling with this team is a national championship, and the floor is really low. So I'm curious to see how this team plays here during their final four games of the year. Next up, we've got TCU and Texas. Both teams are kind of trending in the opposite direction. TCU has been a lot worse than they were last year, while Texas has shown a little bit more flashes, I think, this year. And today, they showed a lot of flashes against a struggling Horn Frogs team. Onyx St. James would throw for five touchdowns for a second straight game, but unlike last week, he was actually pretty efficient in doing so. 
Texas would win this game in a blowout as the defending champions fall to a record of 4-4. Four and four. There's a real chance TCU does not even make a bowl game. I figured there was a real shot that TCU was going to be a lot worse, but I did not expect it to be this bad. And the strange thing about it is that the new quarterback, Tegan Yeager, has been just fine. He was outperformed by Onyx St. James today, but even so, Tegan Yeager has not been the problem for TCU. It has been the defense, which I guess shouldn't be entirely a surprise. I mean, they did lose 10 starters to the NFL, so yeah, I guess that'll happen, but it has been unfortunate to see TCU's decline. The final game of the day, we've got number four, Alabama! Traveling to Knoxville to face off against their hated rival, the Tennessee Volunteers. Alabama played a little bit too close for comfort last week against Arkansas, so because of that, the Crimson Tide made sure to end this game early. With Heisman contending running back Darius Coley back in the lineup after missing most of last week, he would get right to work. Coley would continue his Heisman campaign, and Alabama would steamroll through Tennessee 45-21. Alabama was ranked, I think, number two or three at this point last season, and they kind of fell down a cliff. I don't think they're going to fall through a similar fate because Troy Davenport is a lot better than he was last year. They're still running the ball great. Their defense has still been great. So because of that, I think Alabama is going to hold to form their high ranking. Looking at some of the other scores, Florida State drops 52 on Wake Forest. Didn't Wake Forest allow like 60-something earlier today? Good wins for Notre Dame, along with Navy, who blows out NC State. Cal beats Air Force. They jump up to 19. Cal is still not lost to an FBS opponent this year. Washington is now ranked. South Carolina gets a big win over Texas A&M. Baylor with a nice win. Middle Tennessee State beats ECU 52-7. And Virginia Tech beats Georgia Tech 52-10. Speaking of high scoring, Cincinnati drops 62 on Missouri. South Alabama loses again, this time to UAB. Oklahoma State wins without their star quarterback, beating the Houston Cougars. Tulsa adds another win. They are now 7-1. Kansas State is quietly 5-2, while Vanderbilt is on a losing streak after being ranked going into the day. Pitt has won five in a row while Indiana continues to struggle. I had high hopes for Indiana going into the year, and I have been quite a bit disappointed. I thought they were going to be a good team. Looking down even farther, Iowa with a good win. UNC drops 63 on Rutgers. Arizona and Boise State each get nice wins. Central Michigan loses again, this time to Akron. The Zips have not lost an in-conference game so far this year. Idaho is now quietly 7-1. Memphis is now 6-1. Maryland upsets the struggling Syracuse Orange in overtime. And then looking down even further, Stanford loses again. So the poor Stanford Cardinal go 0-3 today. That's unfortunate as they fall to Fresno State. Looking at the top 25, not a whole lot of movement. Nothing changing in the top four. Georgia takes a little bit of a nosedive with their big loss to Florida. The Gators stay at number two, still not getting any first place votes. Georgia drops to 11. Oregon drops to 12. And then some other big time movers. Mississippi State goes down seven. UCLA and Washington are ranked for the first time this year, along with Kentucky and Texas, while Michigan, Central Michigan, Auburn, and Tennessee drop out. As we look at the Heisman watch, we have Capillar in October going down a spot. Darius Coley goes up two. And Justin Tucker finally is back on the list. Thank God. I think he should be in first place, but whatever. As for your players of the week, on defense, it's Andy Pleasant with three interceptions. On an offense, it's UMass wide receiver Josiah Hart. So let's take a look at where all these conferences are. We're nine weeks into the year. We're getting close to the end. I think we can really start to talk about these conference races and which teams will be competing for conference championships. The big three right now is the SEC, the Big Ten, and the ACC. I think all the at-large teams will come from those conferences. Florida is in a nice spot in the SEC East with Georgia and South Carolina a game back. I believe Florida has already beaten both of those teams this year, so the Gators control their own fate. Then in the West, it looks like a two-team race between Alabama and Oklahoma. Last year, these two teams played each other late in the year for the de facto SEC West Championship, and they will again in Week 13. The ACC, I think, has been the best conference in the country this year. Virginia Tech is the only team to not lose an in-conference game yet. I'm surprised it's them of all teams. In the Atlantic, Florida State, Navy, and Clemson are all separated by half a game. And then in the Coastal, it is Virginia Tech with a slight lead, although Miami and Duke are well within the race. I think any of those six teams can make the college football playoff. And hell, maybe Virginia can as well. 
In the Big Ten, Notre Dame and Ohio State are still undefeated in conference play. Ohio State leads the East. I think Penn State's really their only competition here. Maybe Pitt, but probably not. Then to the West, I think it's a lot closer with Notre Dame, USC, UCLA, and Oregon all well within the race, but currently it looks like Notre Dame and Ohio State are the favorites. In the Big 12, Cincinnati is the only team to not lose an in-conference game. They lead a really bad Big 12 North division. Missouri might be the only other like good team there. The Big 12 South is very close. Everybody is still in the race. Baylor and Kansas State are at the top. But yeah, this conference is pretty bad. I guess Cincinnati is the best team now. Baylor, I guess, is close behind. And then in the Pac-12, Cal is the only team to lose less than two in-conference games, and they have not lost any. Arizona, Boise State, and Washington lead the Pac-12 North, while Cal has a comfortable lead in the South. I don't think Stanford's out of it right now, but Cal looks like the favorites in this conference, despite being without their starting quarterback. In the American, Middle Tennessee State and Memphis are still undefeated in the East, and USF is still in the race. While in the West, Texas Tech, UAB, Rice, South Alabama, and Kansas are all tied. My bet would be on South Alabama to win that division. Tulsa leads the Conference USA by a lot. They should win that conference with no problem. In the back, Bowling Green, Akron, and Kent State have not lost an in-conference game. And interestingly, they are all in the same division. So only one of those teams will get to play in the MAC championship. My guess would be Bowling Green. I think they're the best of the group. And then in the West, T Toledo has the slight lead over Central Michigan and Northern Illinois. In the Mountain West, it's a two-horse race between UNLV and Idaho. And then the Sun Belt, Troy, Georgia State, and Louisiana Lafayette are both undefeated in conference play. So that's where everything stands of most teams having four to five games left on their schedule. Let's take a look at the next episode, weeks 10 through 12. This is week 10. Got some exciting games here. Uh, Notre Dame and Navy is going to be really interesting. I'm curious to see how Navy plays. Pitt and Ohio State. Middle Tennessee State is a tough battle with USF. Mississippi State, Oklahoma is a pretty good game, as is Auburn and Florida. Then going to week 11, Baylor, UCF could be interesting. Oregon, Notre Dame is a big time matchup of the Big Ten. Both of those teams really could use to win that game. Virginia Tech and Miami, I want to see if the Hokies are for real or not. Middle Tennessee State is another tough test with Memphis. If Middle Tennessee State wins their next two games against South Florida and Memphis, they should be able to cakewalk their way to the playoff. South Carolina, Florida should be a fun game, as should USC and Stanford, Alabama, Mississippi State as well. And then in Week 12, Duke and Virginia is a good game. Stanford and Cal, if Cal wins that game, they should cakewalk to the Pac-12 championship. So that might be Stanford's last opportunity. Penn State, Michigan, Notre Dame, Iowa, both fun matchups. Miami, UNC could be pretty good too. So that'll wrap up the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.